Italian uh, Chamber of Deputies. Welcome to Timo Soini, who is Foreign Minister of Finland and also Deputy Prime Minister, leader of the Finns Party, which he founded with three colleagues uh, 20 years ago. He also uh, is a big fan of a British um, football club called Millwall Football Club. And for those who haven't heard, their motto is, they have a famous chant, we are Millwall, we are Millwall, no one likes us, we don't care. <laughs> so I don't know if that has any bearing on Timo's politi political uh, education and success, but um, it's great to welcome uh, him to this panel. Uh, also joining me, Adam Holloway. Adam is a Conservative Member of Parliament who quit uh, the Conservative government to press for a referendum on uh, Brexit. And uh, he's a prominent uh, advocate of leave. And it'd be fascinating to hear from him too about his take on uh, how these new challenges leave the United Kingdom and what its contribution to this new direction in Europe could be. And lastly, Roger Kerpel. Roger has a distinguished career as a journalist, but he set journalism to one side as a member of the Swiss People's Party, and he sits in the Swiss Parliament and is uh, a, an interesting and vocal uh, commentator as well as an active politician. And I'm sure he and Adam, as well as uh, sharing a car up and down the, the mountain, will have an interesting conversation too on their perspectives about sorry some of these challenges. Sorry to correct you. Uh, sorry to correct you. I'm still acting uh, entrepreneur and publisher, which is possible in Switzerland because we have a system where you can be in politics, but uh, which is good also uh, do a normal job. That's an interesting... Uh, that's <laughs> a the, real job. I'm, I'm glad to hear that there are places where that's still possible. Um, although in, in Britain, I think uh, you'd run into trouble if you were holding down two jobs at the same time. Crazy. Um, I'm going to start just by asking each of our panelists to kind of give a little tour d'horizon of, of where we are right now. We see a Europe that's facing demographic challenges. It has an aging population. It's facing um, issues with migration. It's facing issues over its security, both its security in terms internally with potential homegrown terrorism threats, but also externally in terms of spending enough on its own security and, its, and the future of NATO. It's also facing challenges economically as other uh, parts of the world emerge, as India and China step up to become really major players in the global economy. Um, so all of these challenges hitting, as well as some of the technological challenges. We've seen the fourth industrial revolution taking jobs, the promise of automation, but also the threat of automation to people who see uh, robots not as an enabler, but as something that might take away their living. So I'm going to turn first to Carla Rocco. Carla, five-star movement, very recent entry into Italian politics but it's already made a big noise. What do you see as the challenges that your new movement needs to address? Uh, Five Star Movement uh, has uh, a very important role because uh, uh, approach uh, the uh, politic uh, very near to uh, citizens and uh, to citizens' needs uh, in uh, all contexts, uh, in particular, uh, in this period, uh, there are a lot of big change and uh, um, there are some threats and some opportunities. It's very important that uh, uh, the government catch the opportunities, but uh, from the point of view of citizens. How uh, can we do? Uh, we can uh, um, give uh, to give to uh, each country uh, to uh, to um, growing to grow uh, um, by rising uh, the their economic system. But in the meantime, it's important to share the uh, problem in a European context. I, I speak about, for example, uh, risk sharing in, in the field of uh, financial uh, point of view or uh, even uh, for the problem about uh, the migrations. So uh, there are some opportunities that uh, must be um, catched for, for uh, the growing of 
each state. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, important. And uh, this uh, uh, European framework uh, doesn't uh, um, give a good evaluation uh, because uh, there are some uh, very uh, strictly uh, rules, uh, even in the field of uh, financial, and uh, it uh, is uh, uh, not uh, um, a good way to share at a level, uh, an international level, uh, the huge problems that can't find a solution in this way, but can also be postponed if they are not faced in an international level. Um, so uh, it's important there are, uh, that uh, there are some movements that uh, pose some questions and some uh, solutions to uh, the old style uh, way to uh, make policy. So Tima, you started your movement almost as a sort of political garage band and uh, you know, you've grown up a grassroots movement in Finland. You're also now in government. How has that experience kind of shaped your political journey? Do you find it's, it was easier when you were on the outside looking in and it's tougher now that you're actually in a position of power? My motivation to be and uh, when I did go to the politics was to have an impact to make a difference. And of course, when we gained very good election results in due course of time, I, I took that this is my responsibility to go to the government, even I knew that it will most probably decrease our support in, in the polls. But if you have an agenda, what you want to go through with, then you must go into the government, and that I have done, and make an impact and make a difference in Finnish politics. Of course, not that much. I wanted to, but uh, when you have 17%, you shouldn't dictate. And, and what do you see as the challenges in, that Europe's facing right now? If you had to kind of put them in uh, the top three order, from your perspective, mm. from the Finns party, which is, you know, spoken out against things like uh, immigration, you're critical of the, of the EU. What do you, where would you rank the things that Europe's facing right now? I think the biggest is uncertainty and, uh, and uh, the big blocks are on the move. Uh, So-called old order uh, has been challenged uh, in, in, in the big way. And, and that goes also uh, the other side of Atlantic and so forth. I think one, uh, the, the thing one is that there are new policies challenged uh, the old ones as new parties. Then there are also phenomena where there are new uh, strong streams within the parties. For example, in the Republican Party, there is now no any new party, but there are people who have, who have had their influence and, and renewed the party system. Then, of course, I think even though the, the challenging parties are very different from the national background, but they are old and, and to me, tired parties nearly in every country. And, and people, people just don't think it's enough that you have a very established EPP party like in the European Parliament, and the alternative to that is social group, socialist group. And they, they are not exactly... Uh, uh, challenging each other and that is why there is a room for 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 something new and the, the third one which i think uh, europe is very useful for is the security uh, and foreign policy cooperation that is what i support i sup our our neighborhood is very troubled and we need uh, uh, cooperation security wise because we are dependent with each other in security wise that is a positive thing Roger, I mean, Timo touched there on one of the issues that uh, we see across Europe, which is a kind of disgruntlement with the existing sort of managerialist party politics, where voters don't really see much difference between, uh, you know, red and black or, or socialist uh, and social democratic and, and mainstream conservative. Now, the Swiss People's Party was kind of an early entrant into that uh, into that game, but also Switzerland itself is a direct democracy and a very participatory democracy, which is again one of those things that the new politics is very interested in. Brexit had its referendum. Uh, people are pushing now for more uh, more input from voters into decision making. So, what's been your experience? Because it's been a little double edged, hasn't it? You've been successful in getting Swiss voters to say yes to restrictions on immigration, 
but then it looks like the parliamentary process in Switzerland is actually kind of working to reverse that <laughs> yeah, decision or kind absolutely. of uh, put it back in its box. Yeah, we have to define Switzerland first. I mean, you have to understand Switzerland is considered to be a direct democracy. But I always say to my friends in Germany or England, that's not true. Actually, Switzerland is the best organized anarchy in the world. I mean, you don't know at the beginning of a political process who is going to decide. It's a whole mess. But at the very end, uh, mostly very uh, reasonable decisions emerge. I have to probably to explain a bit the situation. If I look at Europe now and the discussions we have in Italy, in Finland, in Germany, also in England, I think I see that in Switzerland we had the very same discussions already in the 90s. The question was, do we want to be part of the European Union, yes or no? Our political elites, they were all in favor. They said, okay, no, Switzerland has to go in. But the voters, the normal people, the democratic sovereign was against it and said, no, um, we have to preserve our independence, our self-reliance. And I think this is the, this, and then Switzerland was attacked of being isolationist and, you know, they want to, don't want to be part of the world. And I think this is a huge understanding. And I was very impressed by Prime Minister Theresa May's speech yesterday. And she said something which is somehow epitomizes the Swiss position as well. An independent national state which decides on its own destiny with a democracy where people try to find solutions for their country and do that, that is no uh, contradiction to an international role. Absolutely. So you can be self-reliant, independent, but you can also play a global role. I would even go further. I would say a membership or an attachment to a European Union limits your international role, but in order to be really open to the world, you have to preserve your flexibility, your national independence. So Switzerland, also my party, which is also considered populist, or today you know what a populist is? Whenever you don't have a reasonable agreement against something you don't like, you say he's a populist. Yes, 40 years ago they said he's a communist, now everybody's a populist. I, I, Switzerland I, I, wants yeah, to... I've yet to hear, Roger, any politician who wants to be an unpopulist. Sure. No, but yeah. just Switzerland wants cooperation with everybody. We want to, a good cooperation also with the EU, but we don't want to marry the EU. So the question now that is up, and this is probably my last remark, in Europe, I meet a lot of people and they are not psychiatrist, uh, psychiatric cases. They are not consumed by fear and paranoia. But there are many people who think, and they have good reasons to believe, that the EU in its current shape is on the wrong track. It's on the wrong track. And that was the decision behind Brexit. Many Brits, uh, British people thought it's on the wrong track. We don't trust this structure. There are institutional flaws in the EU. They are not addressed. The political elites in the EU say, we can manage everything. Wir schaffen das. We can manage, we, we, we can achieve this. And that there is a, a growing discontent. And this is now open to democratic debate and this is something that I think is good. We had it in Switzerland 20 years ago. Well, you're ago. setting up in a perfect way Adam Holloway, who has uh, a strong commitment to uh, not marrying the EU, but divorcing uh, from it. And Adam, you're in a slightly strange position because you're not from a new political party. The Conservative Party goes back and back in time, probably 200 years in, in UK politics. But at the same time, you know, you've always been on the populist side of, of that politics. I can recall uh, one of your, the first time you made it into politics, you've been a soldier, you've been a journalist, but you know, you campaigned with a, a dog with a Union Jack uh, vest on it. Um, you know, you've tapped into a kind of populist vein. To what extent do you share some of the diagnosis that you've heard around from, from colleagues here? Uh, and to what extent do you differ? I mean, are the old parties in need of the kind of new movements that, that Carla represents and that uh, Timo represents and Roger to some well, Our party is very old as well. I mean, we go back to the 19th century in Switzerland, actually, but uh, just we are similar to the conservatives in, in, in England. I mean, I, mean, I think, um, firstly, we shouldn't see, we do see the word populist as somehow being 
pejorative. Um, but I think, you know, what people describe as populism emerges when the ordinary voter feels that things are out of control and yeah. that people aren't really representing what they think. So, you know, let's talk about Brexit, for example. I mean, in my constituency, it was the, it was the, the most um, Eurosceptic in Kent. And I can completely understand why 65% uh, of the people in my constituency who voted, voted for Brexit, because, you know, they'd, they'd seen their, their communities change. I mean, just in the 12 years that I've been in my constituency, it has changed dramatically. Um, and the main driver of that change has been immigration, um, not, not just from the EU, uh, but from all around the world. And vis-a-vis -vis EU immigration, you know, we have... We have lots of people who have come in from Eastern Europe making, you know, rational, sensible choices for their families that, you know, I would make if I was in the same position as them. But, you know, large numbers of Roma from uh, Slovakia, um, you know, lots of fabulously well-educated, hardworking people from Poland. But, you know, if you are, um, you know, in a, in a lower socioeconomic group and you see very able people coming in and, you know, you see it as taking your job. If you find that you know, you're now living in a, in a street where most of the people are no longer speaking English, you start to feel a sense of, of things being sort of out, of out of your control. And that's why I think most of my constituents voted for Brexit, you know, including very large numbers of uh, my, my constituents got about 12% Sikhs in it, um, who've come uh, over the last 40 years, mainly from the town of Jalanda in the Punjab. And I mean, it shouldn't have surprised me, but at first it did. You know, I would say the overwhelming majority of the Sikhs voted for Brexit for, for the same reasons as, um, as, as, as everybody else in the constituency, or the majority of other people in the constituency. So it's this feeling, I think, of, of, of things being out of control. And I don't think we should see the word populist as being pejorative, I think it shows that, you know, mainstream politics isn't actually hitting it where, you know, the mainstream population want it. This is seen as we're almost sort of elites governing on their own behalf and, you know, not actually for the people that we're elected to represent. So, so one of the criticisms we've seen in the last four or five years is that the, there's been rising inequality, especially in, in the developed economies. And that this inequality has ignored ordinary people. That you've seen a squeezed middle class coming down. Now, I guess the answer of, of political scientists would be that politics is supposed to be the break on that. Politics is supposed to bring business round and say, hang on a second, you guys have to redistribute some of these benefits. You can't just spend it on bonuses and extra remuneration at the top level. You've got to share some of that with people. So why haven't politicians done that? And will the new politics and the new politicians be doing more of that? What do you, what do you, what do you yeah, think, Carla and if, if I start with, uh, there is a narr narrative on, on that one that if you want to motivate the rich people, get him bonuses and get him more. If you want to motivate the poor people, get his benefits. And that is, what, 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 what is the outcome of this? Of course, people get angry. Because if, if you have a, are well off, Let's have more, and if you are not well off, let's take then that uh, little uh, amount of money uh, from you in order to motivate you. And, and then, of course, this populist uh, jargon, jargon, I would say, uh, I think the elites and media and, and many others are putting a label to you because you are challenging them. And, uh, and then they are saying that people are, uh, are simple and... Uh, and uh, they don't know about the things. The same people, if they vote conservatives and socialists in, in the parliament elections, they are responsible voters. And that cannot be that way. Carla. So, starting from uh, the yeah. 2008, uh, there is a big crisis that uh, invests uh, the European context in particular. And uh, uh, this is the reason why, uh, for example, uh, uh, as uh, told before, um, for example, migrants uh, that uh, sometimes even uh, have the right to uh, uh, go out from their country because of, because of the wars. 
And, uh, but they find a very difficult situation in the middle class uh, that, of that place that they go because, uh, uh, because of the crisis and because of uh, the governments uh, doesn't give uh, uh, the security, doesn't give uh, a perspective to the citizens. So uh, the confidence uh, disappear and appear the a certain afraid, Economist. and uh, for this uh, reason, so, excuse, yeah. uh, for this reason, uh, they, uh, for example, uh, um, defined uh, populism um, in a, a not right way. Uh, some uh, movements that uh, can uh, instrumentalize some problems, and uh, they uh, are not concentrated uh, on a proposal on the solutions of uh, that problems. Uh, in, uh, uh, on the contrary, a populist movement <coughs> in a right uh, way of term um, means that uh, you are near to the needs of the citizens, and you can form a government that can solve, can give, give a pro perspective for the future. For example, through a universal income that in a certain way can give the possibility to a restruct an economical restructure, mm. restructuring. Uh, because of the very big change of the labour market. But how, how would things like that work? Because we're supposed to be in a European Union where people can move around. So three million unemployed Italians, they should be going for jobs, shouldn't they, under that principle in Czechoslovakia, in new auto factories or in Helsinki? That doesn't seem to be happening. You know, if you're going to be offering universal basic income, which is a really interesting concept that's been discussed this week here, how do you make sure that Italians get it and not, say, young Spanish people so that you don't have a situation where, say, if uh, Timo likes that idea with five and a half million Finns, three million unemployed Italians don't move to Helsinki to take the universal basic income he's offering? How do you actually put in place some of those policies yes, but, uh, in the current framework? Yes, but uh, before I spoke about that some problems must be sharing at, uh, even at an international level uh, that uh, go out of the lines of such, uh, of, of the single uh, nations. Um, and for example, in, in this European framework in particular is not good, for example, for a, 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 a country uh, like Italy, uh, there is uh, a uh, problem of uh, competitiveness of businesses, of our businesses, uh, that must be faced uh, in, uh, in, a, in a, a European context. So there are uh, uh, different problems that, that must be faced, uh, and not mm. only uh, in uh, internal, but even to uh, have a, a phase in international, an uh, over-national phase. One of the reasons people attribute to the rise of, of, of more populist and more, if you like, anti-politics um, in Europe is a, dis, a discontent, a disquiet, even a disgust maybe with traditional political behavior. They want to see people who are not traditional politicians coming in and speaking up for them. And, you know, you've been a journalist, you've been a journalist and a soldier, you know, you're not from, you're not from a traditional political background. and. Uh, and Tima, I think you're probably, are you a lifelong? I'm a uh, politician. Yeah. A lifelong politician. So By definition. By definition. So how do we resolve that? Because isn't one of the problems, one of the, the mottos, I think, used in uh, the Brexit campaign, but which actually used 10 years earlier in a very small local campaign by a chap called Dominic Cummings, who's a very smart, young political campaigner, was politicians talk, we pay. And that, when you say that, that sounds very attractive. Politicians, what do they actually do? They just talk. You know, what's Davos about? It's just talking. Talk, talk, talk. When can we get to action? When can we yeah. do stuff? How do you deal with that, I mean, Roger? The, How do you combat that, <clears throat> that, that kind of cynicism by voting? I mean, if you, if you really look at the, 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 the reality, how it's, how it's out there, I can talk about Switzerland. What is the, the what does a politician basically has to do in a democracy. He has to listen to the people 
He has to figure out what is good for his country. And of course, he has to take seriously the concerns of the people out there. Probably not all of those concerns are rational, whatever. Politicians are not rational either in many respects. And I saw that in the 90s and in the years after the, uh, years, uh, the year 2000, you saw a growing discontent in, in most of the European countries. A lot had to do with migration, of course, migration. Everybody who addressed, he said, we don't want to have open borders. We don't want to have this uncontrolled migration, was considered a racist. He was uh, also at the World Economic Forum. It did uh, sophisticated diagnosis, you know, these people, they are consumed by fears, whatever. They just didn't want <laughs> migration. And there is the growing sentiment, and I think it's based on reality, that politicians, mainstream politicians, didn't care for what the people wanted. Instead, they started to vilify or even defame these people, and when you do this, in a government or in a political establishment, if you start to talk down on the people, this is a very dangerous thing. And we see it in some European countries already um, that also radical movements start to emerge, which is the result uh, of political elites not addressing the sorrows of people. Take the migration crisis 2015. I mean, this was a breach of the German law by Chancellor Merkel. She was not allowed to open the borders for all these non-registered migrants. That was just a breach of Article 16, Article 16 of the German Constitution. She did it. And of course, there were many people saying, hey, we cannot do that. We, 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 are not, we, are not, we, I mean, we don't want that. Who gave the mandate to our Chancellor? We're not a monarchy. She had to do this either in Parliament or whatever, by popular vote. She didn't do it. And the people who criticized that were heavily defamed by the government, and this gave rise to the alternative for Germany, in Germany especially, and this is dangerous. If the, the politician starts to look down on the people, uh, then you're, then you're in, in, in trouble. Adam, I just want to come to you on that. How, do, how does the political system as it's currently set up, and I know there are differences in every European country and the way they manage the democratic process, but broadly speaking, how can it be the case that your party, a year ago, wins a fantastic mandate to govern, and then a year later finds itself almost running against its own supporters? And it's, it's in taken... More sense. Well, I mean, your prime minister then, David Cameron, was a firm oh, see, in that antagonist sense. of Remain, and, uh, and a lot of his cabinet too, including the current prime minister. Has it taken this vote, this, uh, this referendum, to reconnect you with voters in a way that the general election didn't? You know, I really don't, I don't think, I mean, I wish it had, but I, I don't think it had. I mean, I think it, at the root of this, that we have a problem throughout the world, really, but, but, but it, particularly marked in my experience, of this awful sort of professional, managerial, political class, these creatures right across the political spectrum who, you know, are in the Conservatives or the Labour Party at, at, at a good university. They move into a research job in, in a political party. They start working for an MP. They bec become an MP early. Um, and they are, they're literally on a sort of career ladder with very little real diversity of experience. And, um, and I think this leads to, to all, sorts of, uh, all sorts of problems. I was, I was in southern Turkey, not, not that far from the... Syrian border the day before yesterday, and I was sitting with these, uh, these re refugees from Aleppo who were really struggling to pay very high rents um, you know, in, in this town in southern Turkey. And I, just, I looked at them, and I suddenly started to say to myself, wow, you know, you, you're the victims of, of George Bush and, and, and Tony Blair. Um, and I, I really do think it, it's fair to, to, make the, to, to, to relate this, because we, have, we, we commit to to wars on the, the most, um, most sparse <laughs> level of knowledge. Um, we, we, you know, we, we have votes to bomb countries. And m most of the people voting on it couldn't even put their finger on a map. And I think that this is because, well, partly driven by this, this almost career sequence. And what we actually need is we need to inject people who've actually been out there a little bit. 
that's a, a good point and an interesting critique. And if I can put you in a pigeonhole, it's a slightly populist critique. Now, let me turn to a professional politician, maybe to defend them. Timo, you've self-identified as a professional politician. <laughs> yeah. How do you Rather react stressful. to that critique of professional politicians coming from someone who sits for a 200-year-old party? It's, uh, there is uh, many baths, baths to the politics. And of course, if, if you are a politician by definition, it doesn't mean necessarily uh, that you are uprooted from the daily life but uh, it enables it very easily. If you don't go to the constituency, if you don't go to the football games or, or horse track or the ordinary shops, uh, uh, the, the thing is, how do you deliver to your constituency? And, and that is by, by doing it uh, uh, with the rank and file people who actually elect you. It is very easy to, to, to be in the fancy meetings and and discuss with uh, in, international things. It's also important, but the legitimacy to do so comes from your constituency. And if you are not present there, you have no right to perform. Carl, I want to turn to you in a second. I mean, one of the more interesting speakers this week from the world of politics was President Santos from Colombia, who won the Nobel Peace Prize for his work in helping to bridge the divide and the, end the 52-year-old civil war in his country. Um, one of the things he faced was a referendum, which he lost. He put the peace process that he'd negotiated to the Colombian people, and they rejected it at the polls. One of the things he said that it taught him was a huge humility about the process that he was involved in. He'd worked on ending a civil war. He'd worked diligently over four years with people who were terrorists in, in the eyes of his army and, and some of his colleagues to try and get an agreement on a complicated thing that divided, killed a lot of people, and then the voters reject it. He didn't actually step down after that. He carried on working, but he said he worked with a renewed sense of needing to both explain to people better what he was doing and also respond to their fears and their needs. Is there a need from, from your perspective to really reform some of the kind of traditional processes that we have in place, the old representational democracy systems that we have around, and build in a bit more Swissness, maybe, or a bit more participation into those processes? Yes, of course. I think that uh, uh, participation is a, a very important aspect for uh, citizens. So uh, this kind of democracy, these instruments, must be uh, must growing uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in each country. And uh, because, uh, and then, must, uh, in a certain way, uh, listen uh, the, the the answer the citizen uh, for a, a referendum. They, they, the people want uh, through a referendum. In Italy, for example, uh, uh, people ask a new government, and uh, they uh, uh, had asked uh, even through a referendum. But uh, after. Uh, that the moment uh, they, uh, Italy didn't pass to an electoral uh, uh, ask uh, to the citizens uh, and, uh, and a vote uh, for uh, citizens, but uh, they formed another similar government uh, like the previous one. This is not right, because if you ask something to citizens, uh, it's important that uh, you listen what the citizens uh, told you. And uh, that's why uh, we ask for a vote. Uh, we ask for uh, uh, the way in which uh, the uh, people can participate. Mm. Because uh, uh, I, I noticed that uh, the is a very important aspect, the possibility uh, given to the population to participate. There is a, a very a big distance. Uh, the the, the polit politicians uh, of old style politicians uh, are uh, very far from uh, the people. And uh, for this reason, there are a lot of instruments to listen, uh, to uh, get nearer to the population. One of these is the referendum. It, uh, not, it's not important uh, that uh, um, any ideological point of view. It's important uh, that you want to listen to the citizens, you want to solve their problems and uh, uh, to give some perspective. This is the, the way.
Roger, I'm not trying to set you up with a new export opportunity to go along with sort of watches and chocolate with, with democratic consulting. But, you know, obviously Switzerland's got a lot of experience in this kind of right. feedback mechanism. But is it also the case, and you can probably lend uh, a little more wisdom here, because does it put politicians in the position of both having to listen to voters, but also perhaps having to take responsibility for decisions that are awkward to implement and that voters expect to see carried through without necessarily themselves wanting to face the consequences of. Mm -hmm. So in other words, voters tell you they want something, you work out how to deliver it, but in delivering it, you're going to end up maybe punishing them or, or delivering something they might not end up liking. How do you resolve that kind of paradox as a, as a politician? I mean, <clears throat> democracy as a form of government is actually based on the principle that the people do not trust their politicians. They say they can vote them out after four years, five years, whatever. And in Switzerland, the degree of mistrust is even higher because the Swiss... Is that because you've all got second jobs? No, because the Swiss... That. That's good. No, that's, 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 good. that's true for everybody. Because the Swiss mistrust you even after they have elected you because then they come up with initiatives with referenda and this is a difference to the to the brexit probably a little bit because it's not so that the politician can say okay we give a referendum or an initiative to the people it's on the people's initiative they can say i don't agree with Köppel and his stuff and his party i want to have something else then they're gather all the signatures, and then there's a vote if they get enough. And what's the, the effect of that? This system is a system which is very good for the citizens, but of course it's like a prison for the politicians, because the politicians, they would like to realize their fantastic utopias, their great ideas. By the way, the European Union has been implemented, the euro, for example, without any vote of the people in Germany. A German politician once told me, if we had a vote on the introduction of the euro in Germany, the people would have said no. But this question was so important, we couldn't let it uh, go to the people. It was us politicians. That's, the, that's this arrogance that is not good. And in Switzerland, you have to see for a politician, direct democracy is a hard system because it reminds you all the time, you don't have only to listen to the politician, just listen is not enough. As a politician in Switzerland, <laughs> you have to do what the people have obliged you to do, and they give you very precise stuff to do. And if you don't do it, the chance that you're out at the next election is very, very high, and this has a disciplinary, uh, this disciplines our politicians because they know with every decision they make, do I get through with the people? Or is there somebody out there who will launch an initiative? Therefore, it's very good <clears throat> to have this system for Switzerland. But of course, we have a very, very long tradition of it. And I wouldn't, I'm not an imperialist. I don't say adapt our system. I mean, you can be inspired by it, of course. Uh, but it's, it's a good system for Switzerland. Probably it's also a direction that the EU has to take to ask more what the people want, and then really do it, not just, not just listen, really do it. Tima, how do you avoid being, as a politician, being captured when you've got new ideas about how to, how to challenge an existing system? How do you avoid when you enter that system, particularly uh, in your case, as a, going into a sort of coalition system, if you like, having that, making those compromises and ending up not delivering to your core constituents on what you promised you'd deliver when you went into government? I have fun functioned on three different levels. I have been the city councillor for years. Then I went to the European Parliament. Then I went to the Parliament and government. And, uh, and uh, they are different uh, types. But for example, in the local government, if I hadn't been compromised and doing things, I wouldn't have been able to save the school in our area. But I negotiated with others, with other things, and I was able to preserve a school. And uh, then, then European Union Parliament, that was a kind of uh, adventure, I would say, that uh, it's, it's still there, but, uh, but uh, it can, cannot deliver very well. And then, of course, in the governmental level, the option, of course, uh, would be 
uh, we, we have a very good, two very good uh, election results. First, we didn't go in because of immoral, morally hazardous bailout policy. But uh, we were four, four years in the opposition, and what effect that did have to the bailout policy? Nothing. So now we decided with a good uh, election result to go there and get some items and some uh, systems through. But of course it's all, all, all was challenging. But if you don't develop as a politician, as a person, uh, it's like to, to play in fourth division even you have ability to play in the Premier League. And I just want to turn to you on that issue about politics and, and the disconnect. Adam, what, you know, you've said you're very critical of professional politicians and the, the career politician class. At what point do you feel, having come out of a life spent, uh, you know, reporting on wars and, and as a soldier actively on active service, do you come out and feel, actually, I've done politics so long now, I am a politician, you know, and I need to stop, I need to do something else? <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, I actually really relate to, to, to what you just said. I think it is a, it's a real problem. But to go back to this point about, you know, second jobs for politicians, well, people sort of see that in terms of, you know, greedy members of parliament making money, etc. And I don't think, I don't think that should be what it's about. I think we should have politicians who are, you know, engaged in the real world. I mean, the people saying the most interesting things about health in the UK are the, you know, the, the, the very few. Uh, doctors who are still actually, you know, doing surgeries, for example, in the National Health Service. So I think you need politicians who are kind of out there, you know, in the real world. And you, you, we've ended up with sort of settled consensuses, you know, it, within the sort of uh, the, 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 the politics and the journalism, uh, sort of things that are sort of taken as true. So let's take, um, let's take the migrant crisis, you know. Until very recently, you know, everyone was a desperate refugee fleeing war, etc. When the reality is that actually most of the migrants who make it to Europe are, you know, the relatively privileged few who can, who've got the money to pay the people smugglers. And I say this from some experience. I've, I lived undercover in the Sangat camp in, in France, and it was, you know, we were mostly fit young men whose family had sold a parcel of land in Kurdistan or wherever else in order to, 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 you know, to seek a better life in Europe. But there's, always, there's, there's, there's this kind of consensus. And um, unless you have politicians, I'm not suggesting everyone goes and lives in the Sangat camp, but unless you have politicians who've, who've ha had some experience of these places and of these situations, then you'll end up making colossal policy mistakes like Mrs. Merkel made in Germany, and you know, we sent this message to, to everyone living, you know, within 40 hours drive of the Mediterranean, that you know, if you get to Europe, you'll stay in Europe, and that's very bad for the countries in question, and uh, it's completely uncontrolled for the countries that are receiving people. So we've got to get away from the, the consensus on everything and have more real diversity in our politicians. When I can add something that that Adam just said, <clears throat> I mean, I I defend. Um, Angela Merkel, because it's now mainstream that everybody's against her. But of course, you're right. I mean, the, the, the decision was a mistake. But you have to understand, I mean, the German government, a German politician, when there are poor, poor people, whatever their motives are, are outside the European Union, the Germans cannot send their troop there, troops there with, with, with dogs and, and machine guns to keep those people off. That's from their history impossible. I mean, the Germans, she had to do it somehow. Mm. But the deeper problem here is, and this is what this whole migrant crisis shows, that the construction of the European Union as it is today is an intellectual misconception. It was constructed by people, by politicians who didn't ask their voters, who did stuff that was not at all rooted in the daily experience of the people. And now we see the symptoms and the open borders that the EU is not able to control its borders, that the Italians wave through the migrants to Switzerland. It's not because the Italians are bad. It's because they have no incentive to control the borders. So this is a wrong construction. Roger, I want to and bring we have to address it now. It comes yeah. out. Yeah. Uh, just to bring you in. I mean, and, and also, Carl, just to go back to the, the thing about borders and openness. Borders have been open, you know, 
20 odd years since Schengen came into being in, in a large part of Europe. Why aren't we seeing Italian, young, young unemployed Italians behaving like economic migrants and moving to those jobs around what's stopping them from going to where the jobs are in Europe? Because we, you know, we're complaining, aren't we, about migrants passing through these countries? But what about the people who need the jobs who actually are members, people with EU passports? Why aren't we seeing them going to other places? Is something that you're concerned about equipping some of your young people to work outside Italy? Or do you want to keep them inside Italy being Italian? Is it fundamental to you that they stay put in, in Naples? Or do you want to see them equipped to go and get those jobs in Prague or jobs somewhere in Berlin? What's your no, view on that? That's impo the, the, the important issue is that uh, it must be a planification of uh, a solution of this problem and uh, a matching uh, even in, uh, in a job market. Uh, uh, I can't uh, receive a, a huge amount of not controlled people. Uh, I can't know if they are the right to stay in Italy or they have not the right. Uh, so, um, this, uh, uh, this problem must uh, be faced uh, in uh, even uh, um, analyzing the causes because uh, there are some triggers uh, uh, after uh, that, uh, that trigger uh, the, the amount uh, became very, very high in the, uh, and the population that escapes, uh, that escapes from the wars uh, have, uh, is growing now, so uh, we can we have to analyze and uh, to face uh, even uh, the the cause of this uh, uh, this phenomenon, and for example, uh, in at an international level, to reduce. Uh, the number of wars and uh, uh, that cause this uh, uh, this growing and that uh, can uh, that became not uh, manageable at all and but for this reason it, 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 this is the way in which can create afraid for the security but Car Carla can I just say to you we're talking about new policies from uh, from new political movements for, for Europe I mean how how about supporting young Italians in disadvantaged economic areas to move to where the jobs are in Europe? Because currently, is Europe offering anything to those, those people? Helping them to equip them for those jobs? Say if, if Airbus is opening a new plant in, in Toulouse, how can you be sure that someone who's in Puglia is able to go and compete for that, for that job? I mean, what kind of, of policies might the Five Star Movement be able to put in place because to ensure that really happens? Because, uh, for example, I told about uh, the competitiveness of uh, biz Italian businesses. Uh, we are, uh, for example, uh, some internal problems uh, that uh, don't uh, didn't give uh, don't give the possibility to an enterprise to stay in Italy to develop in Italy even uh, caused by a European framework uh, that uh, sees uh, different, for example, uh, fiscal pressure, but in the meantime, the same, the unique uh, money that is a euro and uh, doesn't give the possibility uh, for a nation to have her own money and to give the, uh, her businesses a, a framework of uh, international competitive. So uh, these, are, these are some problems that uh, are not, uh, don't, didn't, they don't, uh, Italian the politicians and the governments uh, don't, uh, are, uh, don't pay attention to this problem, but other, other kind very far from these uh, issues. So is some of the, the new policy framework that you're looking at um, around this group, the idea of, of more uh, support for native industry, for more support for Italian industry, have you said, and for Finnish industry, for Swiss industry, for British industry, to the extent of excluding others, or if you like preferential treatment, are you looking at the idea of, of building some trade barriers to protect what's yours, or potentially taking advantage of the arrangements you have to equip people to find work within a bigger economic 
unit. I mean, that bigger economy for Switzerland is Switzerland. If you're in the canton of Geneva, there's nothing to stop you moving to Zurich. In Finland, mm -hmm. as part of the EU, there's nothing to stop young people moving to jobs in northern Italy. Yeah. So uh, which way are you guys coming down? Are you seeing that there needs to be more protection internally within the EU for your nation states, <clears throat> or that you need to take more advantage of the opportunity you've got? The, the main thing is that the game is fair. And I, I believe that Finnish innovations, Finnish workforce is ready, willing and able to compete in the global market if the <coughs> rules are the same to everybody. As Finns, we produce 60% of the icebreakers in the world and all the good ones. But we cannot go is anywhere. Warming uh, <laughs> <laughs> we shall uh, need uh, icebreakers also in the future. But if there is a protectionist uh, approach for somewhere, we couldn't sell that particularly very good product because of that. I'm self-confident that we Finns can uh, deliver, and, and that is for sure. And then, of course, if we made some decisions for political reasons, for example, in European Union, like agriculture, it, is, uh, it, uh, it has some special, um, uh, uh, special history, and also in the future, it would be, of course, easier and cheaper to buy it abroad. But then, what if the crisis come? Where did you buy it then? And there should be these kind of elements also uh, to protect in some sense, uh, that, that I can understand. But in, 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 in big picture, I'm self-confident that we can deliver. But the rules must be obeyed. And that is the problem in European Union, the bailout policies. And then uh, if there is a burden sharing in immigration, half of the countries don't de deliver and anything else. It cannot be so that if you are rule-based, rule of law country, and you do what is agreed to, you cannot suffer from that. Switzerland's a very competitive, very successful economy. It always comes up top in the uh, World Economic Forum rankings. But uh, we talk about level playing fields for things. As a small country, sometimes difficult to uh, to... Uh, make that playing field level. Mm -hmm. and I mean, I know even in football, the Swiss football team, which is a very uh, worthy, worthy team, uh, sometimes uh, needs people from outside Switzerland to help it compete on the global, absolutely, uh, the global absolutely. playing field. I mean, I sense in your question uh, intellectually not really thought through prejudice, which seems to say that Switzerland is against foreigners. Which, of course, Adrian, is utter very, rubbish. I feel very well. Not at all. Not at all. Very well. No, Switzerland. <laughs> that's, I mean, Switzerland is the country with the highest immigration rate per capita the last 15 years, higher than the United States of America, higher than Great Britain, etc. But now you, your it question was, actually, was... It was actually the question about the being a small country in a, in a right. world of bigger powers. Sure. And, that, and how I mean, do you, this how is you the, win? I mean, this is our way of survival. Switzerland is probably the most successful survival organization of the last 700 years. I mean, we were always a small conglomerate of highly individualistic people and cantons. It took hundreds of years to build a state. And this feeling of David versus Goliath has always been at the core of our system. And what is the, the recipe of Switzerland? We said we have to create a government, a political environment, which enables us to create wealth because we have no natural resources, we have nothing. And therefore, we tried to, to, to say liberty, self-reliance, we decide on our own country. We don't let Brussels or Habsburg or Paris decide on our fate. We are a small country. We are vulnerable. This means we have to be independent and we have to be open to the world. And now the big confusion starts. And one remark I want to address you said is, uh, why are the young people, for example, from Italy not going to Finland or whatever? And there is the, one of the great institutional flaws of the European Union. The European Union is not a, a federal state. It's something in between a union of state and the federal of state. And the free movement of people 
you only have within a state, within the United States of America, within Finland. You don't have it across borders. And why do the people don't move? You have no free movement of people and the welfare state. You cannot have both. And this is the great intellectual error also of the left parties. They think you can have a free movement of people across borders and the welfare state. And this doesn't work together. And we see it in Switzerland now. We had a huge immigration and a rising joblessness among foreigners who are somehow migrating in our welfare state and the people don't want it. They want migration, but not into the welfare system, into our labor market, high qualified, but we don't want people who just come in, lose their job and profit from our very highly developed welfare system. That was a great promo for Switzerland as well. I should say I feel extremely welcome as a Brit in Switzerland. Absolutely. And I and want I'm to add that 25% German. And Nobody's I, perfect. And I want to, <laughs> so. and I and I want to add that one of the one of my main takeaways has been a new respect for punctuality. And I realize we've come to the end of our hour with all of our panelists. Uh, on behalf of all of you, I'd like to thank all of them for being so frank and candid about the problems they face and the things they see on the horizon. So uh, please give them all a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.